Hello everybody, it's Paul Neeson with Torah Life Ministries and we are going to be reading the Torah portion for this coming Shabbat. We're in the book of Numbers, we're reading the second reading in Numbers and we're going to be reading chapter 427 to 789 and this is the 35th reading in this year's Torah cycle going through the whole cycle, the first five books of the Bible known as the Torah which is also known as instructions and guidelines. It's not the law, it's the instructions and guidelines of our Creator. But even if it was the law, wouldn't you want to follow the law of our Creator if He gave us a law to follow? We work so hard to follow the civil law, why not follow the laws that He gave us? But folks, it's the guidelines and instructions, and I'm sick of hearing people say they no longer need to follow the Torah because either they're not Jewish or because of the New Covenant doing away with the Old Covenant. Neither of those two things are true. If you are truly a believer in Yeshua Messiah, you want to do what He said to do. He said, be followers of the way. The way of Messiah and the way of Yeshua was, He was a Torah keeper. He was a Torah teacher. That is what He said to do and how to live. And we are to do our best to follow the instructions and guidelines of our Creator if we want to be blessed. And as we look at this now, we come to the uh, second reading in Numbers here. And we're going to start reading, we're finishing off the... The, the last ch uh, verses of chapter 4, then we're going to go in 5, 6, and 7 in this week's reading. I encourage you to get your Bibles out and also read it when I'm reading it, after I read it, and prior to me reading it uh, every week when I do that, so you get a good understanding of it. Now, we see here and what's been named, all the Israelites are now getting their place and their instructions of what they are to do and where they are to, to their clan or their, their tribe is supposed to be around the tabernacle, exactly what place, the east, west, north, or south side, and there's to have a flag with them, identifying their clan, as they call it, or we could say their tribe. And we saw last week to the duties to the clans under Aaron, and now we're going to continue here. The Gershonite clan, it says, And our Creator said to Moses, Record the names of the members of the clans of the families of the Gershonite division in the tribe of Levi, List all the men between the ages of 30 and 50 who are eligible to serve in the tabernacle. So we, we, they continue to see the serving of the tabernacle. You see, and, and we got to remember, we, you know, we have the tabernacle and we have the tent. And the tabernacle can be the inner court, the outer court, and so on. The tent is right inside the Holy of Holies within the tabernacle. And you had all the tribes around the big whole tabernacle and within the inner tent. Or sound surrounding that, you had the Levites, and they each had a job to do. So now we start this week's Torah portion in verse 427, going and saying, Aaron and his sons will direct the Gershonites regarding their duties, whether it involves moving the equipment or doing the work. They must assign the Gershonites responsibility for the loads that they are to carry. So these are the duties assigned to the Gershonite clans at their tabernacle. They will be directly responsible for Ithamot, the son of Aaron the priest, or directly responsible to him. So he was their supervisor, their boss, so to say, and he told them what to do. And then it gets to the duties of the next clan, the, the Mararite clan, and, and it records those in verse 29. Now these are the record of the names of the members of the clans of the families of the Maravite division of the tribe of Levi. So even within Levi, the Levites had all these different tribes and they each had one particular job in the tabernacle. Some of them, their job was to, to cover the items. Some of them, it was their job to carry the covered items. Some of them, it was their job to cover one specific piece of item or to carry a piece of item. They, uh, some of them, it was to take the tabernacle down and put it up, take the tent, any out of court down and put it up. They all had a particular job because our Creator is a Creator of organization. And we see here and we know through His example, when we are organized in our life, things go more smoothly. And we see here how people were able to do it and how they were blessed, but the disobedience suffered the consequences. So then we see the end of chapter 4 where it says, The summary of the registration. In verse 34 it says, So Moses, Aaron, and the other leaders of the community listed the members of the Kohite division by their clans and families. The list included all the men between 30 and 50 years of age who were eligible for service in a tabernacle, and the total number of came to 2,750. So this was the total of all from the Kohite clans who were eligible to serve in the tabernacle. Moses and Aaron listed them just as our Creator had commanded through Moses. So they had this, and then it goes on to say here in verse 38, 
The Gershonite division was also listed by its clans and families. So we finish up with the Gershonites and the Marite division. And then finally in verse 46, so Moses and Aaron are, and the leaders of Israel listed all the Levites by their clans and families all the men between 30 and 50 years who were eligible for service in the tabernacle recorded as our creator had commanded them through moses each man was assigned to his task and was told what to carry and the registration was completed just as our creator commanded moses now moses was the one that was in charge of getting this word out to all the people he was the prophet and that is exactly what he did and the people actually listened and guess what Everything got completed on schedule according to the way it was. However, when the people didn't listen, they got off schedule and off track, and this is one of the reasons why it took them 40 years to make a trip that should have taken 40 days, because they didn't stay organized and they didn't stay obedient, and these are the things that happened. But to start off the organization, you could just sum it all up uh, of chapter 4, uh, right here in verse 46. Moses and Aaron and the leaders of Israel, as we just read, uh, all of the Levites by their clans and families of uh, all, all the men between 30 and 50 who are eligible for service in a tabernacle and for transportation, they numbered 8,580. When their names were recorded as our Creator commanded through Moses, each man was assigned his task and was told what to carry. And the registration was completed just as our Creator commanded Moses. So they all got their information, they were told what they had to do, and now we get up to continuing the organization in chapter 5 we start seeing here the purity of the camp and we see the whole concept and a principle that's found all throughout the scriptures which is separating the clean from the unclean dividing it remember when the israelites go over the promised land and they go or into the promised land when they cross over to jordan they are told to find the unclean things and do not mingle the seed but destroy those unclean things or they will become a thorn in their side and they will create a big problem. And if you listen, you'll be blessed, but if you don't listen, you'll be cursed. Well, the Israelites went in there and they didn't listen and they were cursed for it. Well, here they've been giving the instructions and the guidelines and our Creator says now, as He says several times throughout the Torah or a good amount of times throughout the Torah about the purity of the camp, keeping the community holy, set apart, and not letting the mingling of the seed with the unclean become with the clean, because it's not the clean that's going to make the unclean clean, it's the unclean that's going to make the clean unclean. And so we are to keep it set apart. So we see chapter 5 here, the purity of the camp. It says, Our Creator gave these instructions to Moses and commanded the people of Israel to remove from the camp anyone who has a skin disease. And we all already read that in the end of the books of that we were reading in Leviticus, the Tazarit, and, and exactly what happened with that. That was a physical contamination of a skin where it manifested on the skin, the clothes, and the house. But it was also a spiritual thing of a Shan Hara, as some people say, talking an evil tongue or creating gossip. And these were the two reasons, physically and spiritually, that the people that were creating that or had that disease had to be removed from the camp. It goes on to say, or a discharge or has become one ceremony unclean by touching a dead person. This command applies to the men and women alike. So we might think that all, all these commands were just given to men, but they certainly weren't. It says to men and women, it says that very clearly. It says, remove them so they will not defile the camp in which I live among them, so that the Israelites did as our Creator commanded Moses and remove such people from the camp. Now, people that don't know their scriptures or people that want to try to create an argument against the Bible or a creator will say, how could a wonderful creator just tell somebody to kill your kid for talking disobedient to his parents or for somebody picking up a stick on a Sabbath, they're going to kill him. Well, I promise you, our creator was setting a statement and showing the severity of disobeying his word. And when he said no work, he said no work. So this guy that picked up the stick, if he was stoned, I guarantee you that nobody else is going to come along and start picking up sticks and start thinking they could escape with this. And, uh, you know, it, it's, whether it was the first time the guy picked up the stick or if it was through mercy, it was the tenth time, whatever, consequences caught up with him. And we all need to understand that consequences will catch up with us. We take things for granted when we don't see things happening, but when something happens, people start listening real quickly. And our Creator was going to get our attention one way or the other, and He wanted to make sure that the camp was pure. And Yeshua talked about all the times about not mixing the weeds and make sure the weeds are, are, are separate 
so it won't destroy the, the, the good things that are growing. Well, that's all about this. It's separating and destroying to keep the community pure. So separate and destroy the unclean things. Verse 5 of chapter 5 says, Then our Creator said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, man or woman, betray our Creator by doing wrong to another person, then they are guilty. Betraying our Creator by doing wrong to another person. Well, why are we betraying our Creator by doing wrong to another person? Because in His Torah guidelines and instructions, He commanded us to treat our neighbor the same way we would treat ourselves. He told us to make sure that we understand and we respect their wife, their property, and everything about them, and we treat each one with love. Yeshua even said, even treat our enemy with love. You know, so when you start this honoring your neighbor you're you are dishonoring our creator you are not glorifying our creator you can't do both at the same time as he says here if you're doing wrong to another person you're doing wrong against him and it's a wonderful way and a wonderful example to look and treat other people as if we were treating messiah himself you know when we see a guy standing on a corner with a sign if that was yeshua standing there would we stop and give money but uh, we see some guy that might not look uh, <laughs> Too, uh, too shabby, so we just drive on by. Well, we have to understand, uh, understand this. You know, when Yeshua was in jail and he, he said, you came to visit me and you came to give me food and you came to visit me when I was sick. They said, we never came to visit you. And then he used the example. Well, when you came to jail to visit this person, you were visiting me. Well, the same thing here. When you're treating others unfairly, when you're treating others wrong, when you're not treating them according to the way our Creator gave us the instruction to treat them, you are dishonoring our Creator. So He warned us not to do that. It says, Betray our Creator by doing wrong to another person. They are guilty. They must confess their sin and make full restitution for what they have done, adding an additional 20% to the returning to it the person that has been wronged. But if the person was wronged is dead, then they are near then they're near relatives to whom restitution can be made the payment belongs to our creator and must be given to this to the priest so basically if the person has has perished that the wrong was done to and they don't have any anybody else in their lineage to give the money to then or, or to give the 20 percent of whatever it was their restitu restitution was coming from they would give it to the priest those who are guilty must also bring a ram as a sacrifice and they will purify and made right with our creator all the sacred offerings that the israelites bring to a priest will belong to him each priest may keep all the sacrificed donations that he receives now we're going to look into more stuff about keeping the community pure, which we've gotten so far away from today, and that is the holiness of marriage. And it's our human nature for us to be jealous, and as humans to be jealous, even our Creator is jealous. But when that jealous is not dealt with or spoken about in a mature, organized manner, it just manifests and then becomes something dangerous. Jealousy itself isn't dangerous, it can actually be motivated to, to do good things. It's uh, what we do with that jealousy and how we handle it. And our Creator told us how one particular form of jealousy was to be handled so the community wouldn't be impure, which would, things would lead to gossip if you didn't know it wasn't handled this way. Things may also lead to Lashana Ra if, if it wasn't handled the way our Creator says. And it all comes down to protecting marital fa faithfulness. And it says here in verse 11, And our Creator said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Suppose a man's wife goes astray and she is unfaithful to her husband. Now let me stop right here and just say, even though they're using this example and during those times, uh, the men had more of a say of women in certain issues like this, a creator has no favorites. And it could have easily have said if a man is unfaithful to his wife. This is the Bible. This isn't some man's thinking or some man's written word. This is the word of our wonderful creator as he gave to Moses and as he was speaking about this. So let's start reading again, verse 11. And our Creator said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. So this was the people of Israel, the community of Israel, not only the Israelites. Some people get that wrong by saying, Oh, the word or the law or the guidelines and instructions of the Torah only for Israelites or Jewish people. Well, no, it's the community of Israel. And there were certainly people there that were not Israelites. Suppose a man's wife goes astray and she is unfaithful to her husband and has sex with another man. 
but neither her husband nor anyone else knows about it. She has defiled herself even though there was no witness and she was not caught in the act. If a husband becomes jealous and suspicious of his wife and needs to know whether or not she has defiled herself. So now we understand if a husband suspects that his wife is doing something even if he didn't catch her, now that suspicion can come in many ways. Maybe by the way she's acting or he just figured it out. But men and women, especially that are married to her, do have special senses that they can pick up on. And regardless of the way it happens, if he doesn't have proof, but he's suspicious, and it would go the other way around too, it's not written here, but surely uh, a woman who is jealous of a husband thinking he slept around, that would not be purifying the community. So one way or another, it would be dealt with. But here they're talking specifically about the spouse uh, uh, going astray on her husband. And it says, if a husband becomes jealous and is suspicious of his wife, and needs to know whether or not she has defiled herself, the husband must bring his wife to the priest. So he must bring his wife to the priest. There was no he could bring, he should bring, no, he must. This is the way this situation must have been dealt with and no other way. He must also bring an offering of two quarts of barley flour to be presented on her behalf. Do not mix it with olive oil or, 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 or frankincense. For it is a jealousy offering, an offering to prove whether or not she is guilty. Now this is very interesting that an offering is brought and we might not, we're not going to understand exactly how this was to prove the guilt. But again, these instructions we have to remember. There were man-made instructions by the rabbis that Yeshua had an issue with. But these were strictly from our Creator via Moses to the people. They weren't the man-made Talmud oral law. This was written Torah. As we're reading it right now, verse, four, or verse 16, uh, 516 of Numbers. The priest then present her to stand trial before our Creator. He must take some holy water in a clay jar and pour into it dust he has taken from the tabernacle floor. When the priest has presented the woman before our Creator, he must unbind her hair and place in her hands the offering of proof. The jealousy offering to be determined whether a husband's suspicions are justified. Now let me just stop right here and say people ask me about coverings, head coverings, are they righteous, are they scriptural? There's no Torah command in the Bible, at least in the Torah or the original covenant, for a woman to wear a head covering. Now we have Paul's writings in a renewed covenant that's a lot of controversy on. To me it clearly says a woman should have a second covering besides her hair. That's what Paul was saying. But in the Torah there's no command that a woman should cover her head. But a righteous woman during the times of these scriptures did have their head covers indeed. And one of the punishments always throughout scripture was for a woman or even a man for their nakedness to be exposed to reveal their shame. So shame and nakedness went hand in hand. When a woman uncovered her head she was considered naked during these times. And here we have the example of a woman who was to be uncovered in public to, to bear her shame if she was found guilty. And it goes on to talk about this jealousy offering here and exactly what happened. So it says, The priest stand before her holding a jar of bitter water and it, that brings a curse to those who are guilty. So only to those who are guilty this jar of water will affect. The priest will then put the woman under oath and say to her, If no other man has had sex with you and you have not gone astray and defiled yourself while under your husband's authority, may, your immune, may you be immune from the effects of this bitter water that brings on the curse. But if you have gone astray by the being unfaithful to your husband, and he has defiled what you have said by having sex with another man, at this point the priest must put the woman under oath by saying, May the people know that our Creator's curse is upon you when he makes you infertile, causing your womb to shrivel and your bottom to swell. Now, may this water bring the curse into your body and cause your abom to swell and your womb to shrivel. And the woman will be required to say, Yes, let it be so. And the priest will wash these curses on a piece of leather and wash them into a bitter water. And he will make the woman drink the bitter water that brings on the curse. When the water enters the body, it will cause bitter suffering if she is guilty. If she is guilty. Now, our Creator gave these instructions. It's his hand definitely had to be on this. Where when she drank this water, if she was guilty, this was going to happen. She would be childless. She would really suffer the consequences. But if she was innocent, none of this would have happened. It only says if she was guilty. 
It goes on saying, verse 25, the priest will take the jealous offering from the woman's hand, lift it up before our Creator, and carry it into the altar. He will take a handful of the flour as a token portion and burn it on the altar, and it will require the woman to drink the water. If she has defiled herself by being unfaithful to her husband, the water that brings on a curse will cause bitter suffering. Her abdomen will swell and her womb will shrink, and her name will be a curse among the people. But if she has not defiled herself and is pure, then she will be unharmed and will still be able to have children. So basically, our, our, our Creator says children are a blessing. To be fruitful and multiply, it's actually a command. And here it says you cannot fill out that command if you've been unfaithful, because if you have, I am going to make your womb shrivel up, and you will not be able to have children, and you will be not able to fill my commandment or my mitzvah of being fruitful and multiplying. So this woman and this drink and this whole situation, uh, for this woman's sake, she best be right. Now, this is very interesting, and I did a whole nother uh, a lecture about this. You can go to my website and look on the Yeshua Said series. It says in the scripture that if a man and a woman are caught in adultery, they are to be stoned. Well, here it says that if the woman has been found guilty, she, her, she will be childless and or she won't be able to have any more children. Her womb would shrivel up and her abdomen would swell out. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter. She'd be stoned if she was found guilty. That was the consequence in those days. If a man brought a husband and was found to be in adultery, they'd be stoned. Now, it might be the first one or the person that caught them in the act of adultery who is the one that is, throws the first stone. And in this case, nobody caught them. She had to come through trial. It was just through an act of jealousy that they were on trial. But if she's found to be guilty, they should have been stoned. And, and, and not the husband, but the man, whoever it was that this woman committed adultery with. So in verse 28 it says, But if she has not defiled herself and is pure, then she will be unharmed and will still be able to have children. Verse 29 says, This is the ritual law for dealing with suspicion. If a woman goes astray and defiles herself by under her husband's authority, or if a man becomes jealous and is suspicious that his wife has been unfaithful, the husband must present his wife before our Creator. And the priest will apply this entire law to her. The husband will be innocent of any guilt in this matter, but his wife will be held accountable for, for her sin. Now we go to chapter 6, and chapter 6 is another remarkable chapter. It talks about making a vow. It talks about the Nazarene oath. And here it says, if Moses, In Moses' day, a person's vow was binding and written contract. It was one thing to say you want to do something, but it was another thing and much more serious when you made a vow to our Creator. Well, now we're going to see the vow of the Nazarene Rite. And this was certainly a set-apart thing, and it could have been for a couple of months, it could have been for a couple of years, or it could have been for a lifetime. We see certain people in Scripture. We see Samson, we see John the Baptist, and, and, and we see Samuel. These were Nazarenes, and I believe Nazarenes for life. And there's the instructions of who those people were going to be. The parents could make that vow for their child before their child's born or as a child's a little baby. However, uh, it the, the gives the instruction for the Nazarite guidelines and instructions. And in verse 6 it says, Then our Creator said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, either man or woman, take the special vow of a Nazarite, setting themselves apart to our Creator in a special way, they must give up wine and other alcoholic drinks. They must not use vinegar made from wine or from other alcoholic drinks. They must not drink fresh grape juice, and they must not include grapes or raisins. As long as they are bound to this Nazarene oath or vow, they are not allowed to eat or drink anything that comes from the grape seed, not even the grape seeds or skins. So basically, there was no wine, there was no, no alcoholic beverages, and nothing to do with grape juice for the people that took this vow. And some people will try to say, well, it's a vow for, for the rest of our lives, or, or is drinking okay for a Christian, and so on. Well, again, it's specifically saying that if you've taken a Nazarene vow, then you are breaking covenant, and you are a liar if you are drinking things with grape, grape juice, or going against the instructions of our Creator. So He told us not to do that. Now... Now, not many people I know will t are taking this vow today, but I certainly met some people who have. I don't know if they did it for the rest of their life, or if they just did it for a short while. But he gives these instructions for the vow in chapter 6, and we're up to 6, 5 here. It says, They must never cut their hair throughout the time of their vow, 
for they are holy and set apart to our Creator until the time of their vow has been fulfilled. They must let their hair grow long, and they must not go near a dead body during the entire period of the vow to our Creator. Even if a dead person is their own father, mother, brother, or sister, they must not defile themselves, for the hair on their head is a symbol of their separation to our Creator. This requirement applies as long as they are set apart to our Creator. So all the instructions and guidelines, who are they for and who are they not for? Are they for the Israelites or are they for everyone? I'll tell you, they're not for those that want to disobey and could care less about our Creator. For all people that proclaim the Shu as the Messiah, these guidelines and instructions for all. For all people aside that they want to take a Nazarite, Nazarene vow, they now had to do something to take that vow. When we make that vow to accept Yeshua as Messiah, we have to do something. Can you imagine here if somebody said, I'm going to accept uh, this vow, this Nazarene vow, Nazarite vow, and I, di I didn't go out and follow it? Well, think about, can you imagine if somebody proclaimed Yeshua Messiah and didn't follow it? And then you got the majority of Christians out there. This was serious stuff, and don't you think there would have been consequences for the Nazarites? Well, there certainly were, and it was certainly consequences or are consequences for people that proclaimed Yeshua as Messiah, and they continue to live a life of just doing something they shouldn't be doing. Now, if any of you are watching and you never even heard the name Yeshua and you don't know who he is, well, you might choose to use the Western pagan Gentile name Jesus, but his name was Yeshua. And the fact that you don't even know the name Yeshua shows me that you're not taking the vow of accepting Yeshua as Messiah as seriously as you can, studying your word, studying what the Creator had told us through His Son Yeshua, and so on. Okay, we're up to verse 6, 9. It says, If someone fail, falls dead besides them, the hair they have dedicated will be defiled. They must wait for seven days and then shave their head. Then they will be cleansed from the defilement. On the eighth day, they must bring two thir turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle. So again, we see the consequence of the result of breaking the vow. So even if somebody's standing next to you and they die, if you're a Nazarite and, you know, and, that, and, and your hair is touched, you got to shave your hair. And these, again, are all set up to set the standard and keep the community pure of whichever community it was. So now we're up to uh, chapter 7 of Numbers, and this is the last chapter in this week's Torah reading. And chapter 7 is the second longest chapter in all of the scriptures. And the number one chapter would be Psalms 119, would be the longest. But the second one is 89 verses, and we're coming up here, chapter 7. It's about offerings and dedication, and it says, On the day Moses set up the tabernacle, he anointed it and set it apart as holy. He also anointed and set apart all the furnitures and the altar with its utensils. The leaders of the Israel, the tribe leaders who had registered the troops, came and brought their offerings. Together they brought six large wagons and twelve oxen, and there was a wagon for every two leaders and an oxen for each leader. They presented these to our Creator in front of the tabernacle. Then the Creator said to Moses, Receive their gifts, and use these oxen and wagons for transporting the tabernacle. Distribute them among the Levites according to the work they have to do. So they already told them what they had to do, where they were to be, and so on. And now he's supplying them with the tools they need to do it. So when he tells us to do something in our life, folks, he's not going to leave us stranded. He will provide with what we need to do it. No, he's not going to provide so you could have the biggest house on a block or the nicest car. He's providing so you can fulfill what he wanted you to do in that role. And for whatever his role is for you, he first tells you what that role is. He, he will speak to you and tell you what your calling is. And then he will provide for you what you need to do it. Distribute them among the Levites according to the work they have to do. So Moses took the wagons and oxen and presented them to the Levites. He gave two wagons and four oxen to the Gershonite division for their work. And he gave four wagons and eight oxen to the Marite division for their work. All their work was done under the leadership of Ithamar, son of Aaron the priest. But he gave none of the wagon oxen to the Kohath division, since they were required to carry the sacred objects of the tabernacle on their shoulders. So it's very tricky here. Moses wasn't going to get caught up with any of these mistakes that somebody might have made. It's, he said no. I have to do exactly what he says and take it literally. And that's what Moses was doing here. 
The leaders also presented dedication gifts for the altar at the time it was anointed. They each placed their gifts before the altar. Our Creator said to Moses, Let our leader bring his gift each day for the dedication of the altar. And then it goes into on the days and what they were. From the first day, uh, this Nathan, the son of uh, Abamadad, uh, the gift he gave. And then on the second day, Nathaniel's gift. On the third day, uh, Elib's gift. The fourth day, so it goes down to all the different gifts. I'm not going to read all of them because this chapter is, is so long here. We're not going to go through all of them. But it goes through all of these different gifts on the tenth day and then... For the next 12 days, it goes into all the gifts that were given. And then we're going to go down to verse 784. So this was the dedication offering brought by the leaders of Israel at the time the altar was anointed. 12 silver platters, 12 silver basins, and 12 gold incense containers. Each silver platter weighed three and a quarter pounds, and each silver basin weighed one and a quarter pounds. The total weight of the silver was 60 pounds, as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. Each of the 12 gold containers that was filled with incense weighed 4 ounces, as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. The total weight of the gold was 3 pounds. 12 young bulls, 12 rams, and 12 one-year-old male lambs were donated for the burnt offerings, along with the prescribed grain offerings. 12 goats and 61 year old male lambs were donated for the peace offerings. This was the dedication offering for the altar after it was anointed. Now, before we finish here with the last verse of chapter 7, we have to think about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and, and how many of them were. Not only were there, were there millions, 2 million, maybe even more people coming over, crossing the Red Sea, running away from the Egyptians. But then you got to think about all these animals that they were taken with them. I mean, and this was a big, big tribe that was coming. And they, they, I mean, remember now, they were only there for a year or so, and they had all these animals. And remember, when they were in Egypt, they, they plundered the Egyptians. And before the Egyptians uh, were enslaving them, they were the, 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 the blessed with so many cattle and everything else. So the Egyptians took it, they got it back, and they took it out of Egypt. And now you're starting to see the numbers and start to understand how big this thing was. This wasn't just a little group of people. This was a big thing, folks. And, and this was what our Creator, His plan. And, and, and you, you had to organize it. So now we go to the last verse here. It says, Whenever Moses went into the tabernacle to speak with our Creator, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the ark's cover, the place of anointment that rests on the ark of the covenant. The Creator spoke to him from there. And we already discussed that when we talk about or showed the building of the tabernacle and the ark of the covenant and the cover on the ark, the seat, the mercy seat. That's where they met, right between the cherubim. That's where he heard our Creator speaking to him. And, and that's the end of this week's Torah portion. Next week is the 36th Torah Porsche reading, and it's going to be Numbers 8, 1 to 12, 16. These are, uh, you know, challenging readings because we, we skip them so often, the names, the numbers, but they're part of the book. So important, we cannot overlook them. So please read them. If you don't understand them, ask questions. Post questions and comments below the video, and you can go back and see all the previous Torah portions and the future ones. Thanks for checking us out. This is Paul Neeson with Torah Life Ministries. Go to my website, www.toralife.tv to check out more videos. Until then, have a great Shabbat, this coming Shabbat, and Shalom Shalom. Come out of the world, oh my people, seek the truth, avoid the evil, learn Yahweh's ways, Torah Life Ministries, come out of the world, 